Hi everybody, welcome back to another video. It's been quite some time since my previous video, a couple months probably. Um, today I'm going to be doing two quick videos and they're both going to be on uh, histories, important history books from history. This is Geoffrey of Monmouth's The History of the Kings of Britain. Now this book is important, um, I would say primarily because it's the one that Shakespeare read and used for um, a few of his plays, uh, most notably King Lear. Uh, there was another one as well, um, I think after one of the other kings mentioned in this book. Um, it's a really interesting book. I would call it literature rather than history. As history, it's complete, almost completely worthless. Um, it's, uh, it was written in the 12th century, at least finished in 1136, the book tells us, and by this Geoffrey of Monmouth. And Geoffrey of Monmouth was a bishop um, at the time, and uh, he was looking back on the history that preceded another well-known history, where it is basically the time when he stops his history is when Bede, who wrote the history of the English people, picked up his history. So these historians didn't want to sort of tread over the histories of, of other of other writers. So basically his history, they, you know, basically has a scope of about 2000 years, so he says, and that goes from his idea of the founding of Britain. And that was with uh, Brutus, who is a son of uh, basically, the Trojans, uh, after the Trojan War, which is obviously completely fictitious, so many places had this idea, most famously uh, Rome itself had the idea that it was founded by um, uh, founded by the Trojans as well. Um, and that's, of course, in the uh, famous, uh, famous play or epic of, uh, of, uh, of Virgil, the Aeneid, right? That Rome was founded by Aeneas, uh, the Trojan uh, warrior. Fictitious, fictitious, fictitious. Uh, the same thing is done uh, in, in Christianity, which is kind of funny because uh, different places, different countries, have the idea that different apostles founded the church in their in their countries and that was a way to claim authority and independence for their church so for instance uh, both Scotland and Russia for instance both claim that the Apostle Andrew uh, brought Christianity to their churches so and Andrew being the brother of Peter the Apostle that gave those churches a lot of you know prestige in that sense so for the same way that uh, different kingdoms want to trace their lineage back to an important king like the Trojans or whatever, um, so you know different different ch uh, churches wanted to trace their their way back to uh, a different apostle, right? So like in Spain, of course, it's Saint James the less. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Saint James is the less or the greater. Um, and of course, India traces back to the Apostle Thomas, which might in fact have some truth to it, but who knows. Um, so anyway, Jeff Jeffrey of Monmouth uh, wants to trace the history of Britain from its founding by Brutus, uh, not to conf be confused with the early Roman king Brutus, nor of course uh, the Brutus of Julius Caesar. Um, so as I said, it's almost utterly fictitious. Um, it features, for instance, uh, some notable chapters include chapter on King Arthur um, and a chapter on Merlin and Merlin's prophecies, which is very interesting, but uh, fictitious. So I wouldn't again, I wouldn't look at this as history. Um, and, and judge it disappointing or good because it's history, uh, but as literature and as a 
gateway into the mind of people at the time. So you're looking at this decently well-educated Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, in the 12th century, looking back on hundreds of years, he's accumulated um, legends and he's uh, looked at various, um, you know, monuments to history. So different churches, different cities, different inscriptions. And he's pieced together this history um, of the world around him, the British world around him. Now, I said it's almost completely worthless, but it's not completely worthless as history. In fact, one of the main dynamics of the second half of the book is basically the war between the Britons, that is these descendants of uh, Brutus, the Trojan, and the Saxons. And sort of the angles are thrown in there occasionally as well. And that's of course true-ish. Um, how, the, how the Angles and the Saxons came to Britain and why they came to Britain and how they settled and sort of conquered uh, much of the country. Uh, the details are fictitious or sort of uh, educated guesses by Geoffrey. Um, but the fact is that this actually happened and how someone like Geoffrey understood this transition between the Britain, uh, the British king, kingship, the great legend and prestige of Arthur and various other British kings, and the transition from that power to the power that he knew in his world uh, of, of England being run by the Angles and the Saxons, and actually, of course, in his time by the Normans, um, how he understood these transitions is, is very interesting. And I'm not sure what a historian would say about the um, relationship between the British and the Celts. Um, Geoffrey names the Celts in different places. But I thought, so, sort of at the very end of the history, Geoffrey remarks that most of the remaining Britons, as they're being conquered and subjected by the Saxons, retreated into Wales and they stopped being called British and they started become, be, being called Welsh. Now, I thought the Welsh were Celts um, and not, not British, but I don't know. But it's interesting how Geoffrey sort of wants to piece these things together and, and explain the world around him. And uh, so the the thing is, is that, again, it's it's really interesting, the mindset. And one of the one of the funny things, of course, is that the wars are depicted uh, anachronistically in terms of uh, the knightly culture that Geoffrey would know. So the very heavily cavalry do dominated warfare of his time with lances and all that stuff. Um, but the fact was that wasn't how the, the Britons and the Angles and the Saxons of the fifth century and sixth century, how they fought each other. Okay. It was, uh, it was a different world altogether, but of course, Geoffrey had no idea. So, um, I couldn't help but thinking for, for as, for as dubious and as, in a sense, worthless as, as the book is as history. Nevertheless, it has some commendable characteristics as literature. And I really found that the last say 20 pages really tied things together as, as a, as a story. Okay. History and story are not the same thing by any means. Like history doesn't have a story. It's just things that happen, but literature does have a story. It has development and beginnings, middles and ends. And I found how Jeffrey understood the history of the Britons as a uh, story of very much along the lines of the, the Hebrew history that they lost their their hold up on the island of Great Britain because they 
gave themselves over to vice and so on. So that initially they conquered Britain because they were virtuous and all that, even though originally not Christian. Um, but they lost the kingdom because of their vice and because of their infighting. And so the way I found that the way that Jeffrey tied that up was very interesting and, and makes the book um, kind of have some charm in that sense. So that's basically all I want to say about this book. It runs from, again, the time of the Trojan War, say 1000 BC or 1200 BC or whenever that was supposed to have happened to about the seventh century where basically Bede uh, begins his ecclesiastical history of the English people. And I want to reread that one really, really soon. So hopefully um, I'll be able to pick up on that. And I think that Bede's history will, will mean a lot more to me now. I haven't read it in over 20 years, probably 25, close to 30 years. But I think the history will mean more now because um, understanding the relationship between the Britons, the Angles and the Saxons a bit better and the Mercians and all that stuff that um, where Bede picks up will, will probably have a greater significance for me or a greater meaning, I suppose, greater precision and that the role that Christianity played in that history and how the, the Saxons were the godless ones and, and all that. And towards the end, we've got um, so the Britons were Christianized much earlier says Geoffrey in Roman times and that of course with the Angles and the Saxons taking over that it was de-Christianized and that's when we get really the beginning point I think of Bede's history is when St. Augustine of Canterbury lands sent by Gregory the Great of uh, the Pope Gregory the Great and that's I think where Bede begins his story and that's mentioned by Geoffrey towards the end of his his history so it really is, these are really, um, you know, beginning of a new era kind of thing is where Jeffrey leaves off. And why would he try to pick up where, you know, why would he carry into Bede's territory? And, and Jeffrey says, you shouldn't really tread on other historians' territory. Uh, he does say that in the book. So it's a very interesting story. I wouldn't call it history in any mo modern sense of the word. Um, but, but, but a rewarding and an interesting read, nevertheless. Um, thanks very much, and I'll get back with another review in just a second. Thanks, guys.